So I want to uh, introduce uh, the moderator for this session is Dr. Alan Sign, and he is the VP of Healthcare Technology uh, from HP Software. Oh, sorry, VP of Healthcare Technology and HP Software at, from Hewlett Packard. And if you saw the cool bags on the chairs, those are all from Hewlett Packard. So, and they're hosting this next break. So his uh, New Year's resolution is to help move big data from being a buzzword, such a buzzword, to something that means more and does something in healthcare. Welcome them. So, so if, I, if I took a poll, if I asked what big data actually means and went around the room, I'm sure that no two people would actually agree. So I, I hope that this is the year that we can actually we can change that. Uh, can you hear me now? So I was just mentioning that if, uh, if I took a poll of big data, what it actually means, we went around the room, I don't think any two people would actually agree uh, on that. So I hope that 2000, uh, 2015 is the year that we can change that. So we have a terrific panel uh, discussion lined up here. I'm excited about that. Uh, we have uh, John Bojanowski, president of Honeywell Care Solutions, Randy Parker, uh, chief executive officer and president of MD Live, and David Ip, uh, product manager of uh, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. And uh, so with that, can I ask each of you just to say a couple of words about your background? Sure. Stern. Can you guys hear me? Uh, Randy, do you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, my name is Randy Parker. I'm the CEO of MD Live. We are building the first virtual healthcare system in the cloud. I have over 30 years experience of building disruptive businesses uh, in the technology consumer space. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm John Bojanowski, president of Honeywell Life Care Solutions. I've uh, been in the healthcare industry for a little over 20 years, uh, mostly in medical devices where we've been able to reduce hospital stays with new surgical procedures or in sports medicine where we've been getting people back on the playing field sooner. The last two and a half years I've been at Honeywell Life Care Solutions where our focus is keeping people, you know, delivering technologies to people's home and, and keeping them uh, out of the hospital and other acute care settings. Great, David? And if this mic is working, all right. Um, my name is David Ip, uh, Senior Product Manager at Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, my background is a little bit different because uh, I don't come from the healthcare side. I actually came from the consumer mobile marketing space and advertising space. So very consumer focused, um, mobile applications, text messaging is kind of my world. And I fell into healthcare about four years ago. And um, so for the startups out there, I felt your pain and uh, hopefully I can share some of that with you guys. Great. So you're here because of your innovations in healthcare, but innovating uh, is very difficult. There are lots of challenges. Uh, maybe we can start out by discussing some of the challenges. David, can you start us? Yeah, I'm sure everybody uh, can identify with the multitude of challenges that we have in the space. Um, HIPAA compliancy, uh, consumer adoption, um, and just overall integration of data. Um, if I were to pick one, uh, I would probably say um, lack of anything interesting to the consumer. Um, throughout our customer experience work that we've done at Anthem, we found that um, consumers, unless they're chronically ill, don't really want to engage with their health care. Now, I think that's starting to change with the Affordable Care Act. Now that with high deductible health plans, consumer-driven health plans, um, people are incentivized now with, you know, with a $1,600 deductible. I care if uh, I'm getting an x-ray at Walmart and it's gonna only going to cost me $200 versus going to uh, the Mayo Clinic and it's going to cost me $2,000. So um, I think one of the challenges have, have been consumer adoption, but I, I really see that changing, um, especially in the next few years. It's going to get pretty exciting. John, do you agree in terms of the, uh, the major challenge? Yeah, I, I, think, I certainly think agree with that, that that's one of the major challenges, um, something we're directly focused on because we put medical technology in people's homes. Um, as you stated, uh, many of those are, are chronically ill patients and, and they understand it, they get it and they engage. You know, for us and where we're moving, it really is about sort of how you opened up with the, the, the big data. And for us, it's, it's not so much big data, it's the right data. And how do you aggregate that data, interpret that data, and deliver it to the clinical professionals in a way that they can actually do something with it that's going to be meaningful and, and, and transition and, and change the care for that particular patient. That's where the example I use, I was at a, at a conference and I happened to be sitting next to the chief medical officer at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. It was the classic big data uh, discussion 
And he leaned over to me and he said, you know, I don't care about all this big data. What I care about is those 15 minutes that I have with my patient and how can I utilize that to, to care for my patient better and to provide better outcomes. And so that's what we're really focused on and that to me is, is still a major challenge. Yeah, that's great and that's what healthcare is all about. Randy, what about the, the challenges? Yeah, so we uh, focus on uh, the telehealth space to provide access using technology. Uh, mobile would be the first uh, modality of choice and, and we have faced a lot of challenges. One is to really, uh, as a disruptor of being able to use technology um, and, and using the technology to provide telehealth services in the right way. It isn't just the technology which we've seen with lots of companies like Verizon and others who have entered the space and have found that it's much more complex than they would actually have thought. What they've missed is, is the, they built the planes, but they have not provided the pilots. They've not taken the physician relationship and the engagement that is required for physicians to do that. The, the other is, is because of the high deductible and the change of accountable care, the consumer has become a chief medical officer of their own home. And because they're paying somewhat out of their pocket, they're expecting that the level of service that they get is equivalent to what they would get as an Apple. Healthcare traditionally has given really poor customer service, and so we're committed to giving extreme customer service, which means that the provider and everyone that's involved has to look at this in a way that they've never before have in healthcare before. Sure. Yeah, I would agree to that. I mean, when you, when you look at our customer experience of, in healthcare, you know, I have a mobile device, I can tap a button and I can have a black car pick me up. You know, I, I can go to a Walgreens and tap my phone and pay my bills. But I step into a provider's office, it's like I go back 20 years in time, I have, to go, I have to go show my paper medical ID card, I have to go fax my records, I have to call my doctor to go fax it to this doctor. I mean, it, we're so far behind in, in, the medical, uh, in the medical world in terms of consumer adoption or provider adoption. Uh, and even payer adoption, just in, in general, the ecosystem. Uh, absolutely, the, the adoption of technology in healthcare lags uh, pretty much every other industry. Yeah. That's, that's why we're here, certainly. Um, it, we have very different uh, pr domains of expertise. Uh, in your respective domains, can you talk a little bit about the way you see the technology evolving, Randy? Yes, yeah, so I, I think that what's happening here is, is what was just said before is, is that there's a requirement to actually change the way healthcare has thought about both prevention and access and treatment. And where we think about uh, telemedicine is quite different and not to create another fragmented silo, but connecting local healthcare infrastructure for care delivery to a virtual experience similar to what online banking had done for branches. Use the technology as a navigator to assess and triage the patient to see whether it is appropriate to use telehealth. If it is, broadcast the Uber of telehealth to all the physicians that are local who can treat that patient. If it's inappropriate, assess that and give them the ability to have a quality experience to actually make a physical appointment, but don't keep them as two separate barriers. John, the evolution? Yeah, and I, I would actually agree with a lot of what you just said. Um, you know, as we all know here in the, in the United States, we're, we, we have a real serious issue relative to the shortage of, of primary care physicians in the not too distant future. Already it's difficult. I missed my, my uh, physical appointment because I was traveling. I went to reschedule. They're rescheduling in February of 2016 is my next opportunity to get my physical. So we do look at those different engagements with those physicians. How do we make them more meaningful? How do we change the way that our day-to-day -day care is delivered and ultimately our ownership of that. And I think that's very true. Now, many of us work for organizations that have high deductible plans. And the reality is, is we have to be more accountable, more responsible for our own health. And we need the tools to be able to do it. And the physicians need to be engaged, the providers need to be engaged, and ultimately the insurance companies needs to be engaged so that it, that it matches and we're not in conflict with each other. Absolutely. Yeah. David, any comments? I would say uh, the evolution where I see the evolution of healthcare going is with accountable care organizations um, moving away from the fee-for-service. I mean, we can leverage business models that already exist that work well in, in this pay-for-performance uh, uh, scheme. The marketing and advertising world has done this for years. Google, 
Facebook, whatever startup, whatever dot com you can imagine, they already have a very, very uh, interesting model where um, there are a lot of parallels to the medical world that the medical world can, can leverage. Um, for instance, when you go to Google, you do a search, and then you end up buying something on Amazon, there is attribution there. Very similar to when a, a patient goes to a doctor, they may see a primary care physician, they may see an anesthesiologist, may be seeing a gynecologist, and depending on the outcome, there could be an attribution model applied to that as well. So um, where I see where we are, I think there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of how the um, reimbursement model works. Um, so I'm excited to see kind of the startups and, and where we're heading um, from a reimbursement model perspective. Great. So in terms of um, uh, disruptive technologies, from a, uh, from a big data perspective, I build and design uh, healthcare analytics uh, platforms for Hewlett Packard. I look at the, uh, what's disruptive there, and I see the democratization of data, the democratization of information. So I'll point out, for instance, uh, Boston Children's has a project called HealthMap which is uh, an open system that can predict epidemics and outbreaks uh, earlier through just looking at social media and informal news sources than the formal medical channels can. I think that's, that's really neat. What do you see as disruptive technologies? John? Yeah, again, we're sort of, I'm focused. I mean, we see a lot of it right out on the floor with, with the, the, the devices um, that are out there. The question is which are, are going to be disruptive. For those that are actually going to be disruptive and, and, and um, cause change, I think, are those ones that um, can aggregate and interpret the data in a different way, as you're talking about, and then has a truly transformative impact on how the providers uh, um, engage with uh, their, their, their patients. So I, I think there's many of us that are working on those angles, and I think those ultimately would be the, the, the next wave of, of disruptors. And those that are taking not necessarily this massive amount of data, but are taking these small chunks, delivering them in a way that's, that's creating meaningful change. U useful, yeah. So I think connect, what we're gonna see is more advancement. We see it somewhat here in the next five years than we've seen in the last 50. We have, a, on, certainly on the connected devices perspective, not in the sense of just the typical Fitbit and data of that perspective, but what's being done on patches and ways to monitor the biometrics that come out of the patient, not only when they're sick, but for more chronic diseases, the low acuity conditions that telehealth in its, is focusing on today isn't going to do very much to bend the healthcare cost curve. It's how you use the technology to make sure that the patient consumer is going to the lowest cost and the highest quality of care. The other part that is a, a challenge that's getting resolved is the reimbursement because there has been a pushback of reimbursement of telehealth services. We spend millions of dollars on lobbyists to explain to medical associations how doing this right, engaging local providers will have great outcomes. And there's been a lot of pushback from local providers over the last couple of years. We see an inflection point. This year in 2015, they approved a $15 billion budget to reimburse with reimbursable codes for uh, monitoring of devices for patients, certainly in different environments. So that will allow innovation to invest in more uh, dynamic solutions than where there was no reimbursement before. David, comments on it? Yeah, so we're, we're in an interesting space. I think um, we are looking at our disruptors, people that are trying to disrupt us from a payer perspective. So there's a, actually a very interesting startup out of New York I won't mention the name, but they are a startup payer that has really thought through the consumer experience. So everything that kind of stinks when you go to a doctor or when you don't get a claim reimbursed, they've kind of um, focused digitally first, mobile first, and uh, web first, and they've come up with a way to be empathetic and understanding the consumer and, and helping making the financial aspects uh, of healthcare um, more positive than it currently is. Um, from a disruption perspective, we are also trying to disrupt the industry by um, some partnerships. Um, we actually have a product called Live Health Online as well, uh, which is because of the reimbursement model that, that's been a challenge for a lot of companies. We, we have telemedicine. So if you are an Anthem member, um, you can for $49 see a doctor anytime you want. Just log on to livehealthonline.com. 
So um, we are constantly scanning the marketplace for disruptors, and there are uh, some interesting players in the marketplace. Um, so it'd be interesting to see where it goes. So if, if I think about innovation, and um, uh, we're here because we're innovators, innovating is hard enough. We, we discussed the challenges. Innovating successfully uh, is, is even harder. Uh, I, I heard a moment ago, Randy, you, you talk about uh, and, uh, you, the, the differences in terms of reimbursements uh, just for, for things like telehealth. Do you think that our current system uh, it actually fosters innovation or does it impede it? David? Let's I'll pass on this one. Come back to me. Come back. <laughs> John or Randy? Um, you know, it, it's interesting for us because you mentioned it earlier. I think you mentioned the online banking as an example and you mentioned in the, uh, in, in the consumer world. Um, you know, in the, in the number of years that I've been in, in healthcare, you know, I, I traditionally started in, um, I spent a lot of time in operating rooms, and I watched a, a lot of innovation taking place in operating rooms, and not all of it was good. You know, surgical procedures were, were taking place with new techniques, new procedures, but the outcomes were not very good for those patients. And so there's a challenge here, and it, the, the easy answer is we should be moving faster, we should look more like a consumer model, we should have the, the uh, ability to, to deliver and receive healthcare in a much more meaningful way. But the question is, is, is there evidence backing what we're doing? You know, in that particular space, it's sort of easier with evidence-based medicine. For the last 15 years, that's been around. I mean, how a patient and when a patient is operated on, what type of procedure is done on them, and how it is done has already been in place for quite some time. Now we're just expanding that much, much more broadly when we're talking about the lifetime of that patient and not just a single event. So I, I think I waffled on that answer, but I think there is some necessary reasons to make it difficult for us as, as manufacturers and, 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 and vendors to, to really deliver change to the, to the uh, healthcare industry, because it really, we need it, that needs to be backed by evidence. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We can't abandon the, the culture of uh, evidence-based medicine we have, but we have to transform it, right, into the, the I, I totally agree. Yeah, and I just want to, just to add to that, I mean, depending on the company and the services you offer, right, if, you're, if you are on the medical side trying to treat conditions, you don't have the luxury of failing fast, because you're, you're, you have people's lives in your hands. But if you're a consumer-focused startup or technology company, then you have the ability to, to, to take some of the lean start methodologies and, and, and crank things out and test and try and, and you know, iterate. Um, so I, you know, I think at the end of the day, it depends on what you're trying to innovate. Um, if you're going to be on the medical side, then it's going to be, it's going to be a little bit of a different approach versus on the consumer side. I think that, in that we are at a point where, because of the pressure that the country's under, that it is the perfect time that you'll see disruption and innovation. I also think that many of the companies that have been operating in healthcare in the US, whether they be payers or systems or any part of the care delivery system that, that exists, are threatened to have what I would say the Kodak moment happen to them. They've operated for 100 years under one premise that has now, over a very short period of time, forced them to try to become more innovative and more efficient, and many of them are going to struggle to be able to do that. You'll see, as he was mentioning, new ways of offering products, services, payers, practices, health systems. They're all going to be challenged to try to rethink the way that they run their businesses, and many of them are going to struggle. So this perfect storm right now, the system that, and the, the, uh, the time is very ripe for, for changes. Is there anything that we need to do, to do or could do in terms of the system to foster that innovation? A lot of this is driven by payment. And so as you start to think, whoever the payer is, whether it's WellPoint or anyone else, that starts to think about how they're going to allow reimbursement and also a more efficient way, not fee-for-service model, but to make sure that everyone in the supply chain from the physician on down is operating with the same level of outcome and success, then I think you're going to see that happen in, in uh, right now. Absolutely. So as we bring together, instead of uh, payers and, uh, and, and providers, we actually have a, a single model where we, you know, the, the, everyone's responsible for, for the risk, bearing the risk in the system and delivering better outcomes. As, as well as the actual consumer patient themselves. There has to be accountability, and there will be, because as we are now having to pay money out of our pocket, it's interesting how we're seeing in our membership, and we'll have you know, over 8 million members on our system this year, we can see that when there is some accountability 
from that consumer patient that they are and they want choices their expectation of the service level that they have is is uh the, the bar has been uh raised to a whole different level. So, so let's talk about that. Uh, let's explore that. In terms of the patient engagement, you know, we, we have innovation, right? Patients are much more involved uh, now. Um, what do you see as the, uh, as, as the, uh, the benefits to the, uh, to, to the new ways in which patients are uh, participating in the system? Yeah, so, so for me, it's all about behavioral changes. Um, you know, we, we can put an activity monitor on and we put a shirt on and it has a sensor. And if we do nothing differently on a day-to-day -day basis, what value has that really brought? Right. So I think that, again, I, you know, we react all the same way. When we're, we're kind of pushed to, to, to make changes. You know, the Affordable Care Act, whether we like it, whether we don't like it, has, has forced us to change the way we do business, the way we deliver health care, the way we receive health care. And I think that is an important component of it. And whether we like it or not, that's going to be the push and the drive. So as we talk about, I'm, I'm just a big believer, it's a combination of active and passive engagement. So when that p person takes a, a, an active role in doing something to benefit their own health, the results are much better. There's not the magic pill. If that's what we're looking for, then that's not the reality. And I think it's incumbent upon the companies that do make the activity monitors and looking at all these sensing devices to think through that, who they partner with, how they engage with it, so it doesn't just be, become a plethora of uh, devices that can be put on a body and then they go away um, because there's so much more attached to that. David, any comments on patient engagement? Yeah, um, so the Anthem model is we don't just want to play, pay your claims, right? I, I think at the end of the day, our senior leadership has identified that if it, it, by 2020, we're going to be looking, Anthem is going to look completely different. We want to be America's valued health partner. I know that's very, you know, it's a cheesy line, right? But we don't want to be just paying your claims. We want to partner with you in your health. Um, you know, last year there was a great Time Magazine article called The Bitter Pill, uh, written by Stephen Brill. Um, everything that's wrong with the medical system or the healthcare system in general right now, just, just kind of follow the money. Um, with payers, we're actually in line with our consumers and our members. When, when the consumers save money, we save money. So, and, and when the consumers are healthy, uh, the payers are happy also. Right? So is the medical costs are lower. So um, you know, I think that as we continue uh, to progress our, our, our value to our members, um, you're going to start seeing more things like life off the line, telehealth. Um, we're going to give you also transparency tools so that when you are in your time of need and, and you're engaging with us with your mobile device and, and you just got a prescription, we're going to tell you that Walgreens is 20% more than CVS. And, and here's a coupon if you need one. Um, and if it's covered under your formulary or not. So um, we, you know, we want to take all the different data points, uh, aggregate all the different uh, medical information and claims information we have. We want to empower you as a member and as, as a patient to take control of your own health. And it's, it's this whole democratization of healthcare, right? Um, I think we're, we're, we're working towards that and, and enabling our members. And I think when we empower our members and they proactively engage, I think uh, it's a win-win for everybody. Are, are there any problems with that? I, I see that uh, you know, perhaps that as uh, people realize that they have access to the healthcare system uh, in, in maybe the same way that they have access to their online banking, their expectations may actually go through the roof of what it can provide. So what do you think that the challenges are with all this, the, the new patient engagement? We work a lot on trying to do that digitally up front. And so what we're moving towards in our development um, process is to look at how we can create as close to an Uber meets Watson as possible. We want to give them the assessment tools in the, in, in, in the most pleasant way for them to not self-diagnose, but to determine based on a, a digital questionnaire where and who they should go to. And once that's established, we want to make that handoff and that experience for the consumer um, of, of the highest degree. So giving better tools, it's not about you know, gems and, 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 and coins and rewards. It's about allowing them to have their health life by using technology in a way to give them the right education so that they're not inconvenienced or that they don't end up going to the emergency department when they really had to go see a physical appointment or where it could have been resolved virtually altogether. 
and comments? Yeah, Randy, I, I mean, I totally agree with that because, in fact, you, know, you look back at the history of, of telehealth, and we're in the remote patient monitoring space. You know, the, the reason it, it struggled in the earlier stages is because people ultimately, when, when, when their diagnostic information or their biometric data came back, the physician said, oh, well, go to the emergency room or go to see your physician. And so the end result was exactly the same anyway. So the engagement piece, it's, it's all of us that touch that individual, that consumer, that patient, to ensure that we are giving them enough tools and the right kinds of tools so that the appropriate decisions are being made, that the physicians are, are actually part of the solution as well. Exactly. You know, it's one of the challenges that I see out here with a lot of this technology that's being built. It's being built from a consumer perspective. And the physician is saying, I don't want to see all this data. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not in a position to do it. So where we've really tried to focus is, let's focus on the physician, the provider side of it, and what's really important to them and what data is important to them. So when that data is delivered, it's actionable. They can do something with it that's going to provide a better interaction. That it's actionable, but that's also that that same clinical assessment is shared amongst all care delivery. And right. so what's that, whether I do my, my visit online, whether I go to a Walgreens clinic, whether I go to my physician practice, or whether I go to the ER, all of those care delivery teams need to be viewing the same documentation. And it can't be overburdening. It's, it's the te technology historically has not taken into consideration how the provider has to be efficient. They're forcing them to do physical exams with their patients, staring at a keyboard, not being able to, in the five or 10 minutes that they're spending with them, looking at them in the face because we're forcing them to uh, operate in a way that is completely inefficient to actually provide the care and the delivery, whether it's virtual or not. Agreed. And, and we push the availability of data, you know, far, far down to the chain to the consumer, uh, you know, and the generation of the data. There used to be a time when uh, if you were sick, you go into the hospital, they might stick some physiologic monitors on you and, you know, someone might make a, a clinical decision, send you out again. And now that physiologic data, you take a look at the show floor, that's coming in all the time, right? And, and so uh, to be able to uh, go from the, this uh, reactive model of medicine uh, to a more proactive model for, for uh, well-being, Do, any comments about that? Yeah, well, um, just kind of on the last point, there's a staggering number that I've heard, and somebody can validate this, but 50% uh, of the time, doctors are making an incorrect uh, diagnosis. Um, maybe more than that, maybe less than that. But I mean, when I heard that, the number, it, it was staggering to me. Um, and the reasoning that, when they explained it to me, was because they're basically working off old data, right? So when you get a blood test, it could be a day old, it could be a few hours old. When you have a CT scan, it could be a week old, it could be a month old. Um, so your medical record is our, our static data points. And, and you are an organism that is constantly evolving and, you're, and the diseases are constantly evolving. So if you see a, 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 your surgeon or if you're seeing your specialist and they're working off old data, how effective can they be? Um, so I think what's interesting with all the technology companies that are here now with the real-time biosensing is that if you can take historical medical data, uh, your, your EMR, you can mash in your, your fitness data, and then you can, you can mash in your social graph and you, know, you can tie in ethnographic, demographic data in this whole big data play, then I think we can do some interesting things. Um, you know, at Anthem, we, we partnered up with uh, IBM on Watson. So we were the very first implementation of uh, artificial intelligence, where you have all this unstructured medical data. Um, we basically provided a tool for our, our doctors and nurses, and they took all that unstructured data and provided actual insights and questions to ask the patients so that when they're engaging them, they're engaging them at a more data sufficient level. Um, so I think. It's going to be more interesting in, in the next few years to see the, the AI plays and, and how all the, the new biometric sensors are going to play in. Um, but I, I, by itself, it's not interesting. When you start tying all these different connections together, I think that's where it gets really cool. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. You ended on a, uh, the, the potential of big data in healthcare, which I, I love and uh, greatly I couldn't have planned any, any better, which is uh, fantastic. I'd like to thank you for, uh, all very much for an interesting, enjoyable, and very insightful conversation.